Um, first, a couple of um, notifications. You might have seen that now the exam is also there for the Mechatronic students. Uh, you need to enroll for both exams. So there's the in-class or the, the assignments, not just in-class, but also the server assignments. Those count for 50%. And there's also the um, exam, which is also for 50%. Those are both now entered into Unisono, right? So that you will see already as soon as the semester finishes or the lecture period finishes, you'll be able then to see what your score for the uh, assignments is quite soon, and then a little bit later also for the exam. So make sure that you enroll for both, because if you don't do this in time, then uh, you might have a problem. Then the examination office needs to uh, redo a few things, so make sure that that happens. And for everybody else as well, you need to enroll, uh, or you need to be enrolled to be able uh, to uh, participate also in the exam. And that is the most important part. Um, I think that's it. I think I don't have any other notifications. Are there any questions about the exam or about what is happening? So the date is fixed now. It's the 14th of March. I think from 9 till 10, so in the morning. Um, it will be one hour, and you should have gotten already quite a bit of practice because it's just like the in-class assignments. It's just that you get multiple of those, and you have to do them again by yourself on paper. Okay? So that's the reason why we do that. So you need to program all by yourself and you need to be able to construct everything. You are allowed one page, double-sided, with you know helping information. You know, if you don't remember anymore how you create um, a, a class object, for instance, and you could, for instance, uh, make notes of that and then use that in the exam. Typically, this is um, helpful sometimes, but usually if you do the, the exercises all the time, then this is probably already there in your in your brain, right? So therefore, I hope that um, that by practice you get uh, to a good exam mostly. Okay, right. So let's uh, continue from where we left off last year. Um, so last year we saw um, classes and objects, and we know that an object is an instantiation of a class, and a class is C plus way for us to think about programs, very data oriented. So we think about what variables we need, what attributes in object oriented uh, programming speak, and what um, methods belong to these attributes. And those are wrapped up in a class. A class is kind of like a blueprint for what any object of this class should look like. And then we can create one or many of those objects that then will have those attributes and will have those methods. Right? That, that's the idea here. And we've seen the, the no, yeah, how this is uh, noted down. So we create a new class with the keyword class. And very important is that for everything that, that we define for that class, which is then between the curly braces, you know, after we define the name, is basically either attributes or methods. And for those attributes or methods, we can also, or we should also declare whether those are private or public. And private and public mean, you know, if uh, we create an object of this class, can then we, with this object, uh, get to this attribute? Or can we, with this object, uh, get to the uh, methods? If the method were here private, then we wouldn't be able to do this. We wouldn't be able to say, we create an object my test of the class tests, and then we access method two by saying my test dot method two. That would not be possible if uh, this were not public, if this were private, for instance. So it is quite important to also declare whether your attributes or your methods are private or public. And then the uh, attributes are basically your variables, one or multiple variables that belong to this data class. Um, or this class, and then uh, one or multiple objects, and these objects are basically then um, functions, as we've seen them before, but the functions are kind of tied to the data, to your set of attributes that are part of this class. And then we ended last um, year with uh, constructors and destructors, which is a, a helper function, a function that is automatically created if you don't define it, um, with the same name as the class with no return type, and this is usually used to initialize 
your attributes that you have for your class. It can also do lots more. It's basically just a function that's automatically called once you create an object. So as soon as I say here of the class test, I create an object that I call my tests, then right here, this um, virtual or this, this default constructor is called. And if I would create my own default constructor here, then whatever is between those curly braces as part of the function implementation, I would basically get in that case. And this would auto automatically be uh, invoked or called. <coughs> so that's the most important things uh, from this chapter. And we um, implemented this particular exercise just to see what happens when you call uh, or when you call a constructor automatically. So in this uh, exercise, we created a class and we created a constructor and destructor that would just print out something to the terminal. And we saw that as soon as we create the object and do nothing else, we automatically then indeed get the constructor to say something in the, in the, in the terminal. And also we get the destructor to say something in the, in the terminal whenever the function ends. In this case, the main function. Right? So that's, that's the, the, the background. And those are the most important concepts programming uh, wise of classes and objects. Now, um, I do uh, uh, encourage you to look for more examples, but also then solve this example, which is a little bit uh, more complex because it uses actual uh, attributes in this case and also a method. So try this out at home. Um, and then last time we also completely converted the maze game that we already prepared in all the weeks before um, into an object-oriented uh, approach. And also there, this is then going back uh, or stepping a few uh, steps back and then saying why do we do this object-oriented approach? Because it makes longer programs, and every program is getting long after a while, longer programs more manageable. So in this case, we had already seen that if you create modules with helper functions, that's how we address this first, we can include those through other, other files. Um, and then our own program can be really shortened and becomes more or easier to read and easier to parse. So that is what has basically happened uh, to our maze game, even though we had in the beginning an entirely, a very, very long file, one file where everything was implemented, we kind of, with separation of concerns, divided this into multiple files. Uh, one file for our main function which executes our program. But this main function now is basically just creating an object maze of class maze with a capital M, where already something is initialized, namely the position of our player. And then the loop, which basically executes the game, is then saying as long as a character that we type in is not Q, we draw the player as this at symbol, um, I'm not sure what two is, or oh, two is a color, I think, the color pair that we had. We then wait for user input, and depending on that user input, we move up, down, left, or right. And even though I have quite a bit of comments here, you probably would already see or uh, estimate what is going to happen by just looking at the names of those functions and, and the way uh, those functions are attached to the objects, because they're methods. So up, down, left, and right are methods of the object maze, of class maze. Um, and the same, um, actually the same for draw. There should be here maze, whoops. Let me just Im immediately fix this. Because draw is indeed a method of our object maze, right? Anything else I missed? I think not. I think those are the main functions that, um, or the main methods that we opened up for users one, one, once we were programming this uh, maze class. Now let's look at this because um, I th I'm not entirely sure where, where we were left. Okay, let's go for the last one. Let's also go here. Can you see this? Oh, this is really small. Let me make this a bit bigger. So maze 04. Um, okay, we have our make file. This is also something that we did last year, um, not towards the end, so that we just have to press make 
and then if it's up to date, it will say so. But if we um, uh, create it or change some of the files that we had, it will recompile only those, link everything together, and our program is up to date or is created. Now let's um, let's see first. Oops, no, not that one. So here we have the implementation of all the methods that's in the CPP file typically. And here we have in the header file our class definition. So as we said, we have a constructor, destructor. The constructor and destructor, by the way, in this case are also quite interesting because they kind of uh, make sure that everything is created for the end curses window that we create whenever we start a maze. Um, and also we dis destroy, or when the destructor is called, we uh, uh, um, perform the end to win function from the end curses library. Then um, redraw is, I think, not used by others. So this could have been also a private attribute, redraw. But then draw up, down, left, and right are the, the methods that we just saw, right? And then this is basically in the CPP function that belongs to the maze or H function. We kind of implement all the, um, all the methods that we promise to implement here, right? That's, that's, that's how this works, and that's what we've seen several times now, by now already. Um, one thing I see here is basically that um, this is kind of um, possible, but it's not very efficient and it's also not very intuitive for object-oriented programming. We have our maze as an object of a type maze class, <coughs> but the real maze that is represented, that, for, that creates the maze, is this structure over here, which is a two-dimensional array of integers. Now, we create this array as a as, as an array each time we redraw the screen, which is very inefficient actually. So each time we redraw the screen, we say we create now a new variable into our memory. The maze looks like this as a 2D structure with ones and zeros, ones for walls, zeros for no walls. And then we draw this. Ideally, the data that you're using should be kind of more centric. And this is what object oriented programming typically is also about, right? So you basically should have this as an attribute of the class. So we can actually now move this. Um, so we can select this. Let's do it like this. Um, there we go. And then paste it here. There we go. Then I just have to remove those lines that I it along. But this would make a lot more sense. Um, and then we can just remove it from here, which is possible, because this function, redraw, is a method of class maze. And class maze has was one of the attributes now, maze. Right? Maze, the 2D array. This is a, perhaps a little bit confusing because in the executable in our main function, we then create maze as an object of type maze, but this is possible, right? This is perfectly possible. So we have our maze array in this case. Um, and another thing that is a little bit weird here perhaps is that we immediately initialize this with, uh, with values. We know that for C programming, you can do this. You can create an array and immediately assign elements to this array of a certain size. This is typically only possible, however, if we, uh, um, if we uh, say how big it is for the last dim dimensions that we have, if it's a multidimensional array. In this case, the 15 is unnecessary. Um, the 10, in this case, which is the number of lines, this maze is high, is not necessary. Well, for the newer C++ uh, uh, standards, you can actually do this. Um, typically, we've said all the time now that if you have a constructor, you can initialize any attribute that you have. But we're new, now doing this without a constructor. But also, this is a possibility. In fact, you can do this for multidimensional arrays. The only thing that you have to be uh, taken care of is that you have to explicitly say the dimensions of all, um, all the rows or columns or whatever you have in your, in your array. Right? But this is possible with... Um, I don't know from which uh, version onwards, but in C++ nowadays, this is a given. 
you can, in a class, as an attribute, also give straight away those as values. So we could have done this, right? Um, that it would have been possible, um, but in traditional C++ courses, typically people don't do this because they use still the older versions of C++. <coughs> we could have done this, of course, of, as well in the constructor. In that case, we would have uh, had here, so we have our constructor that we promised to implement here, and in our constructor, we could have then assigned with a, um, a nested for loop all these values. That would have been a little bit convoluted. This is, of course, a lot shorter and a lot nicer. Okay, so that's just a technicality that you don't have to know. Um, but, and that is the more important thing, we have moved this piece of data more central as part of the class's data set, so to say. And from now on, all the functions that we have, all the methods that belong to this class, can access this maze, which might come in handy later if we want to do something. For instance, test whether um, the player is bumping into a wall when it's moved. Right? That is one of the next things that uh, we should have. But let's see first if that moving actually worked. Um, so we can just make it. And as you see, make automatically noticed that uh, some things needed to be redone. And if we then execute our maze game, then we have what we had before. So with the keys, we can basically move around. But as you can see, we can move through walls. Right? That is one of the things that is still to do. Actually, we can do this right now. Um, so one of the things that we have now is we're now you know, modifying the class and improving it step by step. Now one of the things that um, we have here is that the class now has these two, um, or x underscore x and underscore y as a position of the player. All the methods can access those. And we also have the actual maze construction, like the layout of the maze itself. And also all those methods can, uh, can see those. And at the same time, we have in the class also here implemented how the player can move. Now, this is also something that I think somebody asked in the last lecture. Um, you know, why did we implement this here as a one-liner? Um, and what is the good practice here? I mean, this is really mm -hmm. up to you. But I think in this case, for keeping everything short, it is a lot easier to just have this one-liner here and implement the up function or the up methods as this particular thing, rather than saying here um, semicolon and then here um, treating this in several lines. Then we would have multiple lines here that would be added in the CPP file. This is then way shorter, I would say, and, and easier to, to read as well. The same for the destructor here. Um, we know that the destructor doesn't do that much. It basically just ends the Windows environment that NCursus provided us. So therefore, this one function is then the thing that is executed when we when the object is getting destroyed. Uh, that's, and all the other methods are actually implemented in the CPP file because those are way longer. So I would say for very short, visible methods, just implement them in the class. And for everything else, just try to put those into the CPP file. If those are multiple lines, definitely. Right, so now we want to make sure that if we start the player uh, in the maze, that if the player is moving, say the player is over here, where there's a zero, so that's where the player can be. And if you move up, then the player should not move up because there's a one over there, right? That is what we want to do. How would we implement this? This is still basic C, something that I think we saw in week two or week three in this course. And where would we implement this, especially, right? Does anybody have an answer to the last question? Where would we implement this? <coughs> we need to implement somewhere a check so that whenever we move upwards, for instance, we don't really move upwards because there's a wall over there. How to do that? And if you talk about classes, there's only so many things we can implement things in. Those are attributes. We could add attributes, but that's not really an implementation. We have to implement in one of those functions, in one of those methods of the class maze, we have to implement 
a check so that if the player moves, that the player should not move when uh, the next thing where it moves to is a one. Yeah. That's basically it. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And that, that you do then typically with an if statement, right? Yes. I think yeah, everybody knew that. Perfect. So when I move up, I just have to, I can move upwards. That's what I'm doing right here. The position, the Y position of the player is then decremented. That means it goes up one. But that we first have to check whether this is possible. That means we have to add an if test here. And only if there is a zero where we are going, that means there is a zero where we're going, only then um, our y is decremented. Otherwise, nothing is happening. Right? That is what we're going to do. The only thing that now is left for us to implement is what needs to become at the left side of this equal equal zero, whether this is zero or not. Well, as you said, this is the maze uh, element. So there is an a, a maze element that we have to kind of look for the maze element that we're going to move to. Um, and this over here is the lines, and those are the columns. You can see that over here. So these are the lines, those are the columns, right? So what do we do? And also, that's another thing. The trick we used, because this is a very small maze, we basically repeat this maze over the entire screen. And we did this with the module operator. I hope you remember that. That is, again, also something that I think is one of the basic programming elements that we've seen so far. <coughs> also, that was uh, seen in the first couple of weeks. That makes it whatever we're going to now um, get here um, <coughs> between those uh, square braces needs to also cater for that. So the idea is we need to go up. We want to test whether the, the element that we're moving to is zero. So that means we're going to see whether underscore y minus one, and then over here underscore x is zero or not. That would be partly right. The thing that is not right yet is that if we go as a player then somewhere out of this range, we still need to cater for this as well. If this is getting tricky and complex for you, then I can totally understand this, but I think it's, it would be good as a thought experiment, especially after you've refreshed the module operator. Um, so check this out. So basically that's what, but that's what we do here as well. So we need to um, um, uh, execute the module operator for 10, and in this case for 15. Now again, this 10 and 15 is not so nice, typically, I would have this as some type of um, attribute that, that has the size, and then we would in our constructor also dynamically um, uh, do something about this. But typically, whenever you have constants, like constant numbers in your code, that means you could have done it nicer. But anyway, let's do this uh, this way now. So if the element that I'm moving to, and this is then x is not uh, changed, y is changed, is zero, only then I'm going to uh, decrement the y variable. And this y variable dictates where our uh, user is positioned. That means the next time the position of the user will change and will go one up. That is kind of the construct that we have created here. And this we can do for everything else as well. So we just have to type exactly the same um, for going down, except that here, for going down, you basically say y plus 1, right? Modulo 10. And x does not change that much. All right? Looks OK so far? Yeah. And we do the same for going left and right. The only thing that is changing there, however, is that um, the underscore y does not change. So we can do this for both at the same time. So underscore y is not changing, but we have here underscore x minus 1 modulo 15 equals equals 0. And over here we have 
underscore x plus 1 modo 15 equals equals 0. I hope I didn't make a mistake there, otherwise you'll tell me, right? But this basically is a check to make sure that whenever we are moving, we're not bumping into a wall. Now, obviously, this code did, is becoming a little bit less uh, readable. We should make comments here so that later people that will read this are not completely freaked out. But the nice thing that this illustrates is, since we have now maze as one of the attributes of our maze class, we can do this. Earlier, when our, when our maze was just redraw, part of the redraw function, we could not do this, but here we can do this. You know, we have access to this maze variable, which happens to be a 2D array, which also shows you where the walls and where the corridors are of our maze. Okay? So we created now, or we improved our game a little bit more. Um, hopefully it works, let's see. Oh yes, it does. Uh, and then let's see if it actually works as advertised. So now I move around in the corridors and I'm trying to bump into walls and I can't. So now it is already a little bit trickier to play this game. Right, I cannot move out of the corridors and I can't move into the walls, even if I go um, where we are repeating something. Okay, so again, this I will put in the slides uh, after today, so you can actually try this by yourself. But this would, uh, or this is like our next step. So we created um, the class. We in, we didn't move, or actually we didn't change any lines. So the number of lines that we had from the last version is exactly the same. Here we moved a little bit of code in, like one extra check for the movement methods. And we moved this from a local variable in our one of our methods to an attribute of our class, allowing this over here, right? Just as a, a wrap-up of what we just did. And the benefit is that we now have more functionality. Yes? Um, yes, because of the, yeah, that is a very good question. So basically, if I now move uh, all the way to the border of the screen, what happens then, right? So if I go up, now my, my player is gone and could be anywhere. What happens actually is it does go uh, beyond the screen. And, it, and since this uh, little maze that I created over here, which is only 10 by 15 characters, which is repeated to the left, uh, but also to the bottom, it's also repeated up. We basically have exactly the same. Right? That, that is, that is what, what uh, the actual problem is. It is not being visualized on our screen, but essentially it is there. Uh, oh right, yes. So you mean yeah, yeah. Because so the visualization is 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 done via the XY, right? Um, and the checking whether you can move there is done. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah. So basically, yes. Uh, I, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. But the duplication is just for the visuals, so to say, and for testing where the player can move. Those are two things that are kind of in the background, but they have nothing to do with the actual uh, setup here, yeah. It is a little bit of a, a brain game, that, uh, exactly, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's tricky. And of course we should, or we could also add um, uh, some other bells and whistles, like we could create a border so that the player could not move outside the screen, for instance. Uh, for instance, in the, <coughs> the way I would do this perhaps even is in the constructor, I would add some codes that would look at the columns and the lines. Those are the two constants that you get from n curses, which says how many lines are in your window and how many columns are in your window. And I would create like a rectangle of x's all around. But then, of course, we would also have to check for this. So this if test over here will become slightly longer again and the code will become less readable. Also there, there are methods to, to go around this. Um, of course, you could just do this and then add here in comments what you mean, but then I would say that these 
methods would become candidates to move out into the CPP file because nobody wants to see that when they're just looking at the header file of a class typically. All right? Good, but that was a good question actually. Or um, uh, there's, there's plenty of other things that um, I think are also quite interesting about this implementation. But it's just to show you also how in a, it's still a toy example, of course. This is not a real program as you would see in industry. But you can see already that the complexity is increasing dramatically um, from the very small exercises we have to do every week, just because those are tests. But, um, but, but the, as the code grows, typically the, the number of questions tends to grow as well on how to implement certain things. All right? Good, all right, back to objects and classes. Um, so I will, what I just changed, add uh, to the slide, so you just copy and paste, or you can copy and paste this into uh, uh, your code on the server to reproduce whatever we have for the maze game. <coughs> now in this, um, I could actually also start giving you a lot more information about objects and classes. There are, for instance, special type of methods which are called operators, um, but that I think would, be, would lead too far. I'm just seeing the essence here, and I'm leaving out lots of other things that other courses might see, but I'm keeping it as simple as possible so that if you understand these things, you understand the most important parts of C++ programming. Okay, so the, wh what I'm going to show now in the last parts or last slides of this chapter is just some examples of classes that you can use because these are standard classes. These were programmed, just like the maze class we have seen earlier, by other people, and these have been adopted by so many people that they have become standard classes. That's if you uh, go onto the server or if you install C++ on your computer, these automatically come along with C++. And one of those is um, the string class, which is part of the standard namespace. Again, we haven't seen standard namespace, but as I said, you can basically see this as you know, part of a collection. But the string class is a class that allows you to deal with strings in a much more flexible way as we've seen so far. Remember that when we saw arrays, I told you that an array of characters is nothing more than a string. The special thing is that we typically need to know when the string is ending. So where does the, the sequence of characters that you have uh, stops and typically we have there a zero that is like a delimiter to say op from here on we stop uh, with our string and then for an array that we've seen up until now we need to sh show or we need to tell C++ how big that array is because C++ needs to reserve memory for us whenever we have a variable. Well for strings this is still the case but all this memory management is kind of hidden away inside the class string. So that means whenever you want to, from now on, use a string and you want to do things, things like finding a substring in a string or concatenate strings together or many other things, <coughs> you can use this particular class. So all you have to do, or you don't have to do that much uh, other than what you've done already. We have already included IO stream for 90% of our examples, right? So IO stream as a module we know. And in this module, it's not just C out and C in. Those are objects that uh, represent the terminal. So we can push things to the terminal or read things from the terminal. But in the IO stream, there's also a class. And this class is called string. So whenever we want to create an object of this class, we just have to give it a name, like my first name. That is now the name of a new object of type uh, of class string. <coughs> and if we, we can, for instance, not give this, uh, we can um, uh, um, launch this with the default constructor. That's what we said last time, right? If there's no um, braces, then the default constructor is, is uh, immediately uh, um, launched or called. And we create this uh, my last name. Or we can basically use um, them with a parameter. In this case, we have the string John. So this is a typical C string, right? With the characters uh, capital J, O, H, and N, and then a zero, which we don't see here, but that's what we have. And this is basically then given to our string. So my first name is a string, and it now has the content John inside it. 
How does this manage? We don't know, but we also don't care because from now on, my first name can be used as a string, as you probably already have seen from other uh, programming languages. So we create here three objects. So my first name, my last name, and here we create an object, my string. And those are three objects that are put into memory, and those are basically uh, a set of attributes and a set of methods, just like we've seen just now in the maze example. Um, and over here we assign, for instance, this is an assignment operator, that's something we don't explicitly see, uh, but we assign them the, the, um, to the object the string do. So my last name now holds do as a content in its attributes. My first name holds John as one of its attributes, and that's basically what the string represents. That's the data of the string. And what we can do now is concatenate those two together with the plus operator and assign those to my string. So now my string is John Doe as one name together. Now, this is something that we haven't explicitly seen because we don't see that these operators can be also defined for a class. Uh, but that's also leading too far, I would say. But this plus and this equal sign are, are kind of like methods that can be reinvented uh, or reprogrammed. And that's what, uh, what was done here for the string class. And when we then have those, we basically can pass those uh, to the outputs. And we can, for instance, also uh, invoke methods. Like we want to know how long our string is. Well, then we invoke the length method. So length is here a method of our class string. So whenever we have an object like my string, we can say my string dot length, and then it will give you the length of the string, which is the length of the string John Doe. So John plus Doe over here, right? Um, or you can do, for instance, find. Like you find a particular substring in your string. So we have our my string. Our my string holds the, uh, the contents John Doe. And we want to see where do is found, or where do can be found. And um, what find, in that case, this method gets back, so it's a function, so it returns something in this case as well, just like length. It returns probably an integer, um, which is the index where do is found in that case, the position of where the substring do is found. And that way we can basically execute, whenever we have an object, all the methods that belong to that. All we have to know is which methods we can call. Those are methods that are all public of uh, our class string, um, or not th their class string, so we didn't program this. Um, and typically this is uh, found through um, you know, books or material online. You can just search and then say, you can click on here, then you will see immediately where, uh, what methods and what attributes string has. And there, there's dozens of uh, methods. So basically there's loads of them, just like length, find, and compare. There's lots of other methods that you can just use and that are very helpful in many cases for many, uh, many um, uh, uses, right? So this is basically kind of one example um, where different types of methods of the class string are displayed, are kind of shown how to use those. So from now on, you can deal with strings a lot easier than what we've done so far. Because strings was a difficult concept. If you, uh, if you know Python or Java, you know that over there it is slightly easier. I mean, Java is exactly, exactly the same. Um, there you also have a class string. But uh, over here we have this exactly the same way now. Right? We have a class string and we can deal with strings a lot easier. And just like we, uh, like we have strings, we can also have files. So. And that's also one of the advantages that we have from using your, your server space uh, storage. You have files, you can create files with nano up until now, but you can create and also deal with files from now on in your code as well. That means you can create code, and this code can, then for instance, uh, read the code or read the contents of other files. And since our code are just readable text files, we can just also read other uh, other code files, like CPP files. So if we would have a, f a file test.cpp, and the idea is that this is exactly this file over here, which is a little bit meta, right? We have 
Here, an, uh, uh, our code is called file test.cpp. This we can compile and create an executable out of. And the executable will then read the contents of exactly this file and then output those to the, to the terminal. So we are now creating a program that reads the source code of that program and displays it in the terminal. Right? So this is as an illustration of what you can do or how you can read a file. For that, we need an extra library called fstream. From, the, from these braces, you can see that this is a standard library. So this is something that is provided with C++ all the time. And once you have that, you have um, this if stream class. And this is a class, right? So this standard namespace if stream is a class. And you create an object Maya file where you have to specify then which file you're talking about. So in the current directory, we talk about file test.cpp. And then with this, um, with this file, we then um, read character by character the contents of this text file. So whenever we have now my file, we can actually get to the contents of the file. And one way to do this, there are several ways, but the easiest way to get this is through the get method, where get expects one parameter, which is one character. And this way we can read character per character the contents of our text file that we created with Nano. So if you try this at home, you basically copy paste this over here. You open Nano on your server, paste this inside it, and then uh, compile this code into an executable, and then basically this is exactly what happens. Your executable then reads the file that you just created uh, character by character and, and um, outputs this, as we've already know, uh, to the terminal, okay? And just like this, we can also copy files. So this is an example where exactly the same library is being used. Uh, and in this case, we have two files that we assume, so we have our own um, uh, source code that we have created. So this is this file over here. That is our source file. And then we create also my copy that we want to copy to. So this is something, a file that does not does, uh, exist yet. And just like we just read this particular file, we are now copying it. So instead of sending this character to the output, we send it now to the other objects meaning this object is then slowly increasing in size and getting um, character, character by character the same contents as this file over here. Right? So if you then execute this, then the contents of this file, so copy tests, will then be copied character by character to this particular file. And when you execute this, then this particular uh, uh, file will then suddenly be in your directory. Yes? Yes, and that's also why we can use it uh, with the while, of course. So you're absolutely right. It will it will return a zero, meaning false. At, at the end of the file, the end of the um, as soon as there is no file anymore, I think there's an end of file character typically that is still copied. But then after that, it will basically say the, the file is now done. Yeah. Again, if you want more uh, um, more details, you can click here. And then you see what those standard classes look like, what methods they have. Because they have, of course, lots more than just get. You can get the contents of these files line by line. You can even get b entire blocks. But for the purpose of this, I think the get method is the easiest. So from now on, you can create files in your code. Or you can read from files in your code. OK? Right, and then? We are going to move to a completely new chapter, which is typically a chapter where lots of people that know about pointers already start swallowing. But pointers are not hard. And we're going to see pointers only in the, the essential form in this course. But they're important because this is one of the advantages of C and C++. Pointers are very, very powerful and, um, and allow things that you would not be able to do in other languages. And this has advantages and disadvantages, and that's more or less what I will try to show you in the next couple of minutes, when we're trying to see what pointers are, essentially, and also what they allow. Right, we remind ourselves from the first uh, lesson of this course that whenever we create a program, typically we deal with data in terms of variables. And those variables 
are in our memory. And we try to abstract this in this course as, as far as possible. We don't talk about RAM or about what type of memory we have because there's the heap, there's some other type of it. We basically have this gray thing over here, which is the memory of our computer. And whenever we have an executable, we can declare variables, give them particular values, and change those values. And that's basically what programming is about. So revisiting this in C and C++, all variables have a type. And also that could lead to large discussions, but typically it means that we have to know what uh, our variables are suited or suitable to or for. So we can have integers, we can have characters, we can have floats, we can have bools, but by now we know with classes we can have anything. We can create our own variables and those can become really big. We can create a movie, we can create uh, a world map, um, we can create very complex structures uh, and put those straight into memory as a block. Now we've, we've seen this and we know that an integer, for instance, has four bytes or a character has one byte or a boolean as well and a float has four bytes, a double has eight bytes. This is not something you need to know by heart, but it's important to know that there is a storage issue there. You can only store as much and depending on how many bytes is represented via these variables, you can also encode as much. So that, that, that's the reason why we can't, if we for instance have um, an integer, a normal integer, we can't have extremely large values. As we saw in the beginning, then we have to move to a float or a double if you want to uh, represent extremely large values, either in the negative or in the positive uh, sides. And the same for <coughs> the, um, the accuracy, the, the floating point accuracy of a float. You bump into regions there as well soon and then you have to go from a float to a double because a double has more space. Right, that is, that is the idea here. And even though an integer and a float have exactly the same, occupy the same space, they are represented in completely different ways. So if we represent a 12, both for the integer and for the float, we see that the internal contents are completely different. Here when we, when we count 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0 for this last byte, and this is 12, you might notice, but, uh, but over here it's a lot harder to see why this would be representing a 12. This is the internal part of a C++ uh, or a C++ management of memory, but basically those are the essential parts. Whenever you create a variable, it's for a particular purpose and you have to think what type fits here. And then depending on what type fits there, you basically have something representing that into memory. And knowing that, or kind of keeping tabs on that as a programmer is, is a good idea, typically. Now, what we haven't seen, or what we haven't seen that explicitly yet, is that we, at all of those variables are somewhere in memory and memory is typically addressable. That means you have addresses that say where in the memory those variables are stored. In the easiest case, this is like a very trivial, not realistic, but very trivial case, is we start uh, um, reserving space in our memory for all the variables that we have in our program from zero on. So in memory space zero, we have our integer. And we, if we then say that every memory block occupies one byte, then the next uh, variable, like my symbol, which is a character, it starts at memory space four. That means my integer starts at zero, occupies four bytes. My symbol starts at uh, location four. My float starts at location five and occupies four bytes. And because of that, my boolean starts at, at uh, location nine, right? So we count it by bytes. That is kind of what is happening not like this, a little bit more complex, but anyway, that's I think the, the nicest way of representing this, what is happening in the background when you're coding. Whenever you reserve variables, because that's typically what you always need to do when you're coding, whenever you reserve variables, those are stored and managed in memory like this. Now for pointers, uh, we have now suddenly a new type of variable. So let's look at this program as kind of a, an easy, but also the, the essential part of what pointers are. Here we create an integer called my integer and we immediately give it a value 12. There it is. And it's getting 
in the background, we, ca we don't see this right in our code, but, uh, or we don't have to define this in our code, but C++ is reserving this somewhere in memory and therefore has, this has a memory address. Let's say it has address 70, right? So at address 70 in our memory, we have now four bytes reserved and this constellation of zeros and ones, so 1100 zero, zero, is 12, right? So that is now what we have in our memory. What we can do with pointers is we can create a new thing. So a pointer is a new type, basically, to do exactly the same. We reserve something in memory, and how long it is, I took here two bytes, but this is typically not two bytes, um, which represents a pointer. And therefore also there's this star over here and over here. If the star was not there, then this would be an integer, just like my integer over here. But the star kind of belongs to this int over here and says this is a pointer to an integer variable. And at the moment we didn't do anything with this pointer yet. So it's just reserved over here. So the contents could be zero, could be anything else as well. And C++ has marked this as a pointer to an integer variable and its name is my int pointer. So we create now a new type of variable. What is the use of this variable? Well, if you have an ampersand in front of a normal variable, then this represents, or what you get back, is the address of this variable. So ampersand my integer returns this 70 over here. This is not the critical part of, of pointers, but it's helpful to know now in this example, because this is now assigned to my int pointer. You can see it over here. The contents have changed. 01000110 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 is binary code for 70, right? So now my int pointer's contents are 70. So the way you can visualize this is that this pointer points to exactly this location in memory, right? And this is the advantage of pointers. You can create a new variable and this variable allows you to get or to point to any other variable in your memory space without even knowing uh, what, those, what those integers are. You just, uh, you just need to know which address this is pointing to. And then, that's the second part of pointers, is you can change those values from the pointer, not from uh, that address space that was over there. So here, we have our pointer, my int pointer. If you put a star in front of that, that is called dereferencing the pointer. And it means we follow that arrow over here and then we deal with the location that the pointer contains. So the pointer contains 70. So we look at the integer that is at memory uh, spot 70 over here. And then we, for instance, can change this value to 17, what we do over here. So 17, 1, 7, right? And that is what is done right now. So this is 0001, 0001 is the binary code for 17. That means without accessing this my integer, our integer that we initially created, we have now created a pointer that points at this integer and that immediately also is able to read but also change the value of this integer through the referencing as we see over here. And that is the power of pointers. We basically create a new thing in our memory and this new thing can point anywhere else in memory and we can deal with that. And that allows us to create especially lots of data structures that normally otherwise would be very hard to create. Things like trees or graphs, which you may have heard of, um, or dynamic arrays is also one of those things that pointers are often used for. So there's things that you can create also at runtime. So basically, while the program is running, you can then with uh, your pointer suddenly create things into memory. You can manage memory yourself. Whenever you create a, uh, a pointer, you need to tell what type of type it is pointing to. That is kind of a little bit restrictive. But other than that, you can deal with any space in memory. Okay? That is very important to know. If you understand this, then you understand already the, the essence of pointers.
The second part is that you can create variables through pointers, or you can manage memory space through pointers, uh, even if those were not reserved by variables yet. Because in this example over here, we had to create this memory space first through my integer, which is our variable that we created, right? You don't need to do that. There are two keywords that we now, from now on, will see called new and delete. And this will allow you to reserve memory space in, in your memory through pointers. Only through pointers you can do this. But that's also what pointers allow. So here's our uh, very similar example or an example where we've changed this a little bit. We don't now use or explicitly say we create a new integer. No, we say we have now here a pointer to an integer. Null over here is typically what you do when you create a, no, a new pointer and you don't immediately assign this to something. If you don't um, immediately assign this to something, then you usually use null. This is important because as we had over here, for instance, whenever I, over here, whenever I created, no, over here, whenever I created my uh, pointer to an integer over here, I had here zeros, but this could have been anything, right? And then if I would have then immediately dereferenced my int pointer, I could have accessed any part of my memory, which is very dangerous, right? That it could be somebody else memory space that you could perhaps even uh, address. You could, um, uh, of, of other processes that, are, uh, that might be running. So that is dangerous and insecure, especially that as well. So a good programming practice is to always, whenever you deal with a point, whenever you create a pointer, point it to null. That means it gives C++ the information, this is a new pointer, and the contents of this pointer are invalid. So this is not really pointing yet to a real memory space. So that's kind of like a security mechanism. <coughs> now, if we want, if we have our pointer now, and we want to point to something meaningful, because other, up until now we just have the pointer in our memory, we don't have an integer at this point, right? But we can create this with a new keyword. And we do this with saying my int pointer equals new int. And the new int based part basically will tell C++ that C++ should create a new variable of type int. The tricky thing here, or the, what you probably already get, uh, saw, not guess, but saw usually, is that this thing does not have a name. So this memory space is just like before. It is an integer. It can get values, or that the values can be changed. But this uh, is not addressable through a name. It is only addressable to my int pointer at this point. Right? So my int pointer is a new pointer, and it points to a new memory space, 70 and it has particular contents. And again, these contents don't need to be zero. They can contain what was ever, whatever was there before. And then we can change the value of this new integer, this unnamed anonymous integer. So we give it now again the value 17. So 0001, 0001 is binary for 17. So through my pointer, I created now a new memory space, which is an integer, and this integer I can deal with like any other integer through my pointer name. And that is, that is what is uh, quite interesting as well as, as, a, as a programming technique. And whenever you create something, you can also delete something. That's why we have the delete keyword as well. So if we delete now explicitly my int pointer, what happens then is the pointer is still there. You know, this thing is still there. But what it was pointing to explicitly in memory is now deleted. So it's given free, right? And then when we uh, go out of the main function, then this uh, my int pointer as a variable, so this thing over here, will be freed up as well, okay? So that's basically what pointers do and how pointers can be used. And this is the essence. You basically are dealing with your entire memory space, and you can access everything in your memory space, in your computer's memory space. Typically, this is uh, guarded off by the operating system and by the process that is giving to you. But also there, lots of things can go wrong if you have a really big uh, program. Like if you have a really big project and a really big program, and you are operating with um, 
pointers and suddenly your pointer can access everything into your, in, in your, that is uh, given to your program, that is something extremely powerful. You basically can, uh, uh, can capture any part of your memory, you can change the values, um, you can add variables and delete those variables while the function is still going on. That's also something that we haven't seen yet. Right? We have seen that if a function ends, then all the variables that were created in that function are deleted. But over here now, at will, we can delete parts of our memory or give parts of our memory free to the operating system to use. Right? And, and that is very powerful, very dangerous um, at the same time. Yes. Um, no, it will, it will create, uh, no, this will not create an ad or give the address, it will create a pointer, basically. Yeah. So this is basically, um, uh, it will not create a new pointer, it will basically, so th that's uh, part of this assignment. Uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what is happening in the background. Yeah, exactly. No, because this is at the right side. So you need to tell new what you're creating. <coughs> this could have been a double as well, and then you needed to create. Can I do that? No, my pointer, my pointer is new double. Yeah. yeah no, no, that would be then C plus plus would freak out because it would say, and it's good that it has a reason because my int pointer is an integer pointer. That what it what it's known, and what is on the right <coughs> side would then be a pointer to a double. And then the assignment operator over here would uh, cause this to not work. Probably already at compile time. Yeah. Sorry? <coughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. This is, I mean, and again, we will see exactly that also later because, um, now, no, I'm not going to go into polymorphism yet. Um, but yes, but I mean, I think for clarity, let's just keep this as a rule of thumb. Whenever you create a pointer, you need to say what type it points to. And it's, it would be good programming practice if you stick to that. But uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There are loose ends right there. But just like I said earlier, for instance, um, there are ways to implicitly convert from one to another. Let's no, not do that. I would also say here, let's not do that. Typically, this is also part of programming guidelines, where people then say there are ways to do this in a cleaner way. So, uh, you know, basically, I think it's uh, very interesting, um, uh, but the conclusion is really stick to the type, to the data type of your variable. And it would otherwise be very tricky to circumvent or to, so to explain what data types you can use and what not. Therefore, if you have a pointer to an integer, just type new int, and that will work. Yes? Uh, how can I use this new int if the first one doesn't exist? How can I use this new int? This new int won't be usable at all. It's only useful through the pointer. Yes. And basically, now through dereferencing the pointer, you can get to the contents of this new integer. And of course, that is leading actually to the next slide. Thank you for that question. Um, if you forget to delete this. So for instance, if you have a function where I'm creating through a, a pointer a new integer, and I give this a new value for instance, but see, I didn't delete this. I had something with new, so I created a new integer, but I did not delete here. Whenever you exit this function over here, what happens is that uh, this memory space is still reserved. So it means whatever you do with new keeps on being reserved into memory, even if the pointer that was pointed to that is lost. And that's kind of what this example illustrates. So we have our main function and we execute our function over here. Our function created a new integer. So this is our new integer. It has no name, but we know that it's of type integer, therefore it holds uh, four bytes. 
and it has the content 17. As you can see over here, if you would type this in a binary to decimal converter, um, and then at this point in our main function, we would still be stuck with this memory reserved. And that is basically a memory leak, just as we've seen earlier uh, with, with, um, in, in other functions. So basically, this would be bad. So you didn't, do, you didn't delete what you created before, what you reserved before, and that means that only by ending uh, your program, this will still be given away. But as long as your program is running, this memory is still reserved and an integer four bytes are being stuck there. And of course you can scale this up if this function over here would have a for loop where this was done thousands of times, you create thousands of integers into memory, this is perfectly possible, or arrays of, but you forget to, to free this memory with the delete keyword, then all this memory would still be stuck. And then you could easily get into low memory problems, right? Then your memory, even if it is gigabytes uh, big, or terabytes, um, would then not last that long if you don't uh, free this memory. That means whenever you have new, you should also, you yourself as a programmer, invoke delete to remove this space that you created through, through, the, um, through the pointer. Okay, so that is quite important. Um, so that is basically what is happening here. So it, this is exactly the same, but in, in this case we delete our pointer, and because we delete our pointer, the memory is freed up, and when we are right here, the memory is not, or the memory space that the pointer is pointed to is not there anymore. But as you can see, in the low, I mean, in the background, our pointer still has that value, right? Um, or could still have that value. It usually does not. Um, but what then happens is uh, it, it, it could have a, a particular value that is not zero. It does not, definitely does not have uh, the null value. This typically is up to the programmer to be again pointing to null. Here in this case, since we're now ending the function, it's not really that critical. But typically you have other things that are happening afterwards in the same function. And then somebody who is changing the code later might have then the idea to use your pointer and that could lead again to big errors, big, um, big problems. So typically whenever you delete a pointer, it is good practice to immediately also assign the null pointer to that pointer. So that you kind of say to, uh, to the C++ environment, Whatever comes later, my in pointer is not pointing to a valid memory address, okay? So here we deleted uh, uh, our uh, integer ourselves and therefore we don't have any uh, problems with the memory allocation or we don't uh, uh, have the possibility anymore afterwards to, after this function ends, um, we basically also don't have my in pointer that is also removed and then um, that is basically what happens there. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here because that is already quite a bit. Later today, the new exercise will come online for the, ser uh, for the server exercise, and that will be due next week, Friday. Next week, Friday, there will be also an in-class assignment, your last in-class assignment of the semester, okay? And, and then I think there will be one small exercise still on the server, and that will be it. So that would be it for your assignments. Is there an exam tomorrow? The? Is there an exam tomorrow? No, no. Next week. Next week is the class. So basically we're now um, going to practice classes still and also pointers. That's what the server example will be about and what the in-class assignment will be about as well. So that's what we are training for now. Okay? Yes, another question? No, it's not tomorrow. If it says in Moodle, it's wrong, and I will change it. Thank you for noti no, noticing that. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll look in Moodle what I what I noticed there because I actually did mark the weeks, but don't worry. There's no in class assignment tomorrow. It's next week, Friday. From from now on, you have one and a half week to do the server assignments which will be on the same topic as the in-class assignments. Yes, the exam date is 14th of March, March, 9 till 10. 
It's also, that is in Moodle. I put that in Moodle, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday. Exactly. And again, for those that uh, came a little bit later, for mechatronics students especially, you need to enroll in two exams, which is basically the exam for your, um, in uh, not in for all the assignments, which counts for 50%, and then for your exam. Uh, but I think for all the others, so HCI, people from the fir third faculty, f people from the fourth faculty, um, uh, fifth faculty, sorry, those um, I think will see only one, uh, which is then the exam, as far as I know. If not, then also enroll into the, into the exercises part. All right? Any other questions? No? Then we'll see each other tomorrow morning. All right, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you then.